Wow. Oh, that really? is wonderfully preserved. 20 years ago, Time Team was an ambitious experiment. That is beautiful. We wanted to breathe new life into history on television. To take cameras right into the trenches and be there as lost worlds were uncovered before our very eyes. My hand's shaking. Oh, come here, look at, look at that. <laughs> it, that is absolutely quite incredible. The experiment worked. Time Team was up and running. In 20 years, we've dug 224 sites, uncovering thousands of years of history. None of us knew <laughs> that this was here until this moment. Look at that, Keep as going. it comes. Live archaeology on television. <laughs> Excavating everything from neat back gardens to royal palaces, creating millions of new enthusiasts for archaeology. Hello, Mark. going to dig up everything. <laughs> for this anniversary special, we've trawled the archive to relive this remarkable saga. This is the story of how, over 20 years, Time Team transformed the understanding of archaeology in Britain and even made it entertaining. In 1993, we first took to the road. Our goal was to discover unknown archaeology right across Britain and film the process come what may. But we'd no idea whether this risky venture would succeed, because Time Team was a radical departure from the way television usually presented archaeology. But then every century, not just the 20th, has brought its own peculiar hazard for the safety of the Parthenon. Programmes often felt like lectures and were mostly about the classical world. So the time was ripe for a new kind of programme. It emerged from Channel 4's Time Signs. This series was the TV debut for two archaeologists, Mick Aston... Because somewhere near here, near Second Farm, uh, an object like this was found. ..and Phil Harding. Certainly by the end of the Neolithic, vast parts of this country had been cleared of the natural woodland. Time Signs followed a typical archaeological dig over a whole year, but it sparked producer Tim Taylor to create a radical new TV programme, setting up our own digs to last for just three days. These discussions took place, with me and Tim in particular, about, well, what are the other ways we could do archaeology on telly, you know? And I knew that if you, if you went to a new village, there are certain things you do to work out why it looks like it does. And the idea was you drop them into a parish village and in three days they'd sort out something new. And to help interpret all this archaeology for a wide audience and keep the experts on their toes, they needed a presenter. Back then, my best-known connection with history came from playing Baldrick in Blackadder, someone whose grasp on reality wasn't always reliable. So unlikely casting it may have been, and we looked a bit of a motley crew. But behind the wall of hair and dubious fashion, we were a crack team. Well, they were. This week's time team are Mick Aston. In that very first series, the idea of uncovering archaeology in just three days was untested. Success would depend on everyone in the team applying their skills and knowledge. Phil Harding. Wessex Archaeological Trust, field archaeologist. Well, obviously, I had the talent, the good looks, the sex appeal. And, well, <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> And on an April weekend in 1993, the team spilled out onto a Somerset field at Athelney to film for the first Time Team series. We had high hopes. Our mission was to find the very place where King Alfred the Great and his supporters reputedly holed up to escape from Viking invaders 1,200 years ago. We had our experts, but we all thought it would be a good idea to have me perform a potted version of the history we were about to investigate right at the top of the programme. King Alfred the Great is on the run from the Vikings, right? And he sees this little mud hut 
that belongs to a swineherd and his wife, and he tells them that he's a deserter from the English army, and they agree to hide him. And the swineherd goes off and gets on with his jobs. She goes off and does her chores. And Alfred's sitting there, completely wrapped in thought, and he doesn't notice this huge black cloud pouring out of the fire, and the swineherd's wife comes back in, and she is absolutely livid. You couldn't be bothered to keep an eye on my cakes, could you, she says, but you wouldn't mind shoveling them down your throat when they were baked, would you, you greedy fat lummox? Oh, acting on time, team, those were the days. And if you thought that was odd, there was another oddity about that first programme. We didn't actually, well, dig anything. It never happened again, but it was a pretty bold way to kick off an archaeology series, and it made unravelling this complex site a real challenge. We didn't put any trenches in at Athelney. We just did some field walking. And there's an old element of chance. Oh, wonder what I'll find. It's just you, your eyes, your experience, you're looking at the ground, and Lady Luck might throw up an object. The basic idea is that they pick up anything that looks interesting and pop it into a bag, and it'll be sorted out later. This non-digging approach to archaeology wasn't total madness. We had a revolutionary trick up our sleeves, geophysics. It was a cutting-edge technique for detecting anything underground. How are you doing there, John? Yeah, not too bad if it wasn't for the damn roof. And this was the first <laughs> encounter with our geophys supremo, yeah, John Gator resplendent in tracksuit and ZZ top beard. Could you tell me, in words that a Beano reader would understand, <laughs> exactly how you achieve the results that you do? Yeah, um, basically what we've got here is a, a box of electronics. Inside are some batteries. They're sending an the electric current into the ground through one of the probes. The other probes actually measures the resistance of the earth to that passage of the current. John spent the last 20 years trying to explain geophysics to us all, just as patiently as ever. There, so if you've got a stone wall at that point, the electric current goes into the ground, bang. But it is the ability of John's geophys machines to see things underground that's become the vital ingredient in our digs. And at Athelney, it had the perfect debut. Geophysics came into its own in that programme because of that sort of miraculous moment. John presses the button on the computer and, and it prints out this picture. Right, well, you're now going to see in front of your very eyes a plot that will astound you. Gosh, look at that! <laughs> it's pretty amazing. That's the monastic yeah. church, is it, at the top? Oh, oh, we're, not, we're not very happy with this, actually. She's never been excavated. There's no pictures, there's no prints, there's no drawings. So this is no. actually the first time anybody's ever That's seen anybody's ever seen it. The layout of, of the church of Athelney Abbey. So Athelney <laughs> Abbey actually started. Well, they've actually got the money the right Just place. about yeah. about here. And spread all the way back past that monument there. And no one knew about it for centuries and centuries till about three minutes ago. I think that's a pretty good first for time team. For the technology of the early 90s, this was a triumph. And, you know, if ever there was an argument that geophys is essential and you do it first, get it sorted out, there it was. The development of faster and faster computers over the last two decades has enabled geophys to deliver ever more intriguing and accurate images of what lies below the ground. It's become the cornerstone of three-day digging. After that unique shovel-free first programme, digging did become the heart and soul of Time Team. And for the very first time, TV audiences could follow the process of discovery with all its twists and turns as it happened. We went to Ribchester in Lancashire to uncover its extensive Roman history. Phil opened one big trench to unearth a special kind of Roman defensive ditch designed to trap any attacking ancient Brits. But when I stepped in Phil's trench, I unwittingly committed a cardinal sin. So the, your enemy is charging across the field, yeah. and they have to drop down into this deep ditch, which is obviously much deeper than it is now. Ah, and then they scramble up the other scramble side. He learnt about that, didn't he? Because he got told, in no uncertain terms, that that is not what you do. 
And then after a while, he only did it to wind me up because he knew full well that if he did jump in, I would explode. While I was learning the rules of trench etiquette, we were all discovering new things about our own history. The first series also took us to the Brecon Beacons, looking underwater to investigate a man-made Iron Age island in Llangorst Lake. We fished out an evocative range of finds. We're on the island and they've just discovered under the water a Dark Ages shale finger ring. It's good really Lord. good, Nick. Over. After the final shoot of the first series, we all went back to our day jobs. Well, they did. I didn't have one. But we were all uncertain whether Time Team had a future. By the end of the summer of 1993, the first series was in the can, but we'd got no idea how it would go down with the general public because none of the episodes had been transmitted yet. We all waited with bated breath. Ah! This is the Western Daily Press, 1994. Cancel all forthcoming engagements on Sunday evenings. Lie to your friends. Hoodwink the kids. Cheat, if necessary, on your marital partner. But on no account, miss. Time team. Time Team's first series was broadcast in 1994. To our relief, and maybe even surprise, our scruffy ensemble got a thumbs up from the viewers, including at least one archaeologist, Francis Pryor, who wasn't part of the team back then, but was watching avidly. It really worked, because it was more eccentric and more strange than anything that was being offered on television, and yet they were serious. Just thought I'd do a bit of scraping. You know, there was all the humour, all the, all the mucking around, but beneath it all, the programme was serious, and that's what gave it real edge. Over the next three series, we continued our archaeological tour of Britain. We tackled an entire medieval castle and its grounds in the heart of a Sunderland housing estate. What do you think of that, then? Oh, wow. Yeah, it's pretty smart, isn't it? Eh? Yeah. And we took on our first high-profile site, Lambeth Palace, where we were in search of London's Roman main road. Boy! In 1996, in Cornwall, we went below ground, uncovering the true extent of a prehistoric chamber. You see, this actually comes up into a side passage where, to where there's a stone across the end now. And then it's beyond there that, uh, you know, the idea is that the passage went on. And in Devon, we opened our very first trench underwater in a quest to find the wreck of a merchant vessel that sank off Tynmouth 400 years ago. So, no JCB on this dig, we used what was effectively a giant vacuum cleaner. I'm lying on the seabed and I'm looking into a damn great hole. And yet, at the bottom of the hole, there's this unmistakable piece of timber. <laughs> Whatever the type of dig, we aimed to strip away the jargon and make archaeology feel like an accessible pursuit. Fire! <laughs> when Time Team first started, most people, me included really, had only the vaguest idea of what it was that archaeologists did on a site. But Time Team took the cameras right into the trenches. That'll do. That'll be sufficient. And we took the trenches right to people's doorsteps in the belief that ordinary back gardens probably have the best hidden histories. So we came knocking. Good morning, Mr. Hall. Good morning. This is the crew from Time Team. Ah. He wants to know if he can dig a big hole in your flower bed, basically. Oh, That's what he's asking. Doing the garden archaeology, I think, became one of our sort of trademarks, really. You can learn a lot, and actually there are areas you can't get at in other, any other way. Look at the curve on that. Wow. That is beautiful. We've done some amazing damage to back gardens over the years. <laughs> we was wondering whether or not you found anything in the way of skeletons in your garden. No. One of our early back garden digs is still one of our biggest going across ten gardens in Birmingham. 
It was also our first foray into industrial history, a relatively new field for archaeology. We were hunting for a lost mint that produced coinage not just for Britain, but countries throughout the British Empire. 200 years ago, the world's very first steam-powered mint would have stood somewhere around here among what's now a network of back gardens. Local archaeologists had already discovered an unusual underground tunnel which would have housed an extraordinary drive shaft. So what was it for? What it did is carry a 210-foot cast iron shaft from a steam engine and bringing power to all of the buildings. Big shaft going yeah, down through the centre, here. Down the centre, on bearings. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But what we're trying to do, Tony, is track it that way. Yeah. Because it's, it's on the way in that direction to power the workshop up there. It would have fed mechanical power to the machine shops where the coins were manufactured. We've actually got some oh, metal crikey. coin blanks. These are already cut out, ready to be stamped. That's oh, we've got right. a bit of the cut out from cut out as well. From, yeah. These coin blanks, remnants from the manufacturing process, were our breakthrough find. In its heyday, the mint produced 40,000 coins per hour, all powered by the enormous drive shaft. Our excavation followed the route of the drive shaft tunnel to see if we could locate the building that would have housed the machines where the coins were cut from sheet metal. When we opened up this area, first of all, we got this what appeared like a plinth of bricks yeah, yes. with You're... very, very nice cut-off ends. So all of this now becomes the wall of the building. It means that the middle cutting room here is virtually slap bang under 154. So the cutting room is bang underneath the middle of your sitting room. So, so we've <laughs> got to ask my parents if we can take the carpet up and uh, have a dig in there, have we? <laughs> I, I don't know whether that'll be. <laughs> the sitting room was a step too far even for us. We didn't need to dig it because we plotted the layout of the whole factory which supplied coinage to the countries of the British Empire. The archaeology under these people's houses and back gardens was linked with the birth of the global economy. Within a few years, we were deploying more technology and a lot of outside experts to help us tackle bigger and more complex sites. It looks like a piece of ossified cartilage. And even I now knew what ossified cartilage was. Among the 50 or so people on and off screen, there were pottery gurus, historians and small finds experts. It meant we could achieve a huge amount in our scheduled three days. And we were developing new and colourful ways of recreating the past. One site that cried out for it was in Kemerton, Worcestershire. Francis is nearly dark. <laughs> it was lovely first thing. <laughs> like many ancient sites, it was a struggle to show much solid archaeology. We could see the ghost of an Iron Age roundhouse, but needed to do more to illustrate it. In the very early days, when they wanted to do graphics on screen, as it were, they used to rig up some scaffolding and drape a huge blue plastic sheet over the back of you. And then, later, they can paint an Iron Age house on that blue screen. Oh, thank you for inviting us into your home. It's lovely to see you. <laughs> what do you think of it? I love this place. The most important thing, in the Iron Age, just like today, life revolved, and in a roundhouse it does revolve, around a central fire. So in the middle is the fire. That keeps you warm, but it also cooks your food. The smoke goes up and out through the roof. No chimney, you'll notice. Visualising the history has always been important to Time Team. From the very first programme, artist Victor Ambrus has been conjuring up impressionistic scenes based on our discoveries. And as hardware became faster and software smarter, we could recreate entire worlds. Envisaging Roman supply vessels moving cargo around Britain's coasts. Towering above us here is his grave. And a street of tombs near Hadrian's Wall. From quite small traces of evidence, we can almost bring the past to life. By 1999, we'd made six series, completed over 40 digs, and have become a fixture of Sunday tea time viewing. 
We were ready for a bigger challenge. We were about to go live with the biggest dig ever to be broadcast on television from the city of York. We know that burials extend out that way. Yeah. What we don't know is whether they extend down that way and just how far. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the 1990s, Time Team's band of maverick archaeologists had stormed the gates. We'd proved our credentials and were ready to take on some of the most important sites in Britain. The city of York is stuffed full of monuments and archaeology, and now it was to be the location of our most ambitious dig to date. Taking on not just one, but three top sites across the city, we were going to broadcast live across a bank holiday weekend. I can remember going to York and there were these big sort of AA road signs sort of sticking at them saying, Time Team Live, you know, and I'm going, what? What's going on? Archaeology doesn't naturally lend itself to live television. You can't predict if and when you'll make that breakthrough. So even with a team of 150, eight miles of cables and 500 cups of strong coffee, it was still all down to me to hold it together. We're here in York to find out more about how the Romans, the Vikings and the Normans developed this famous and historic city, how they lived and how they died. With three huge digs taking place at the same time, it was a real test of the team's nerve and skill. And we were about to make some astounding finds. On one of York's streets, a team led by Sandy Toxvig found irrefutable evidence of the Vikings who would have lived and worked right here. Can I come down? Yeah, yes. come down. Come Do have a look at this. What have you got? I think you might find this really fascinating. I think what we've got here is a shoe which has been thrown away in a rubbish pit or a backyard. We're now in deposits which are probably very close to being Viking Age. So I think it's a Viking Age shoe. On our Norman site, we uncovered the pillars of a monastic hospital. So we've got one pillar base over there where Katie we've is. We've got one in the middle, yeah. which is a, a, a column top. But it was another astounding discovery under the lawn of one of York's finest hotels that would deliver our most powerful story. But look, on the, on the magnetic, same area, and you can see we've got these nice individual blob-type things. Now, I'm wondering, are these burials? There was only one way to find out, which was a five-metre-long trench. Phil couldn't wait to get his spade in. And under the watchful eye of some newlyweds... You better not get in a trench, I don't think. I think you're not quite dressed for that, are you, really? The trench descended. And then on day two, as predicted on the Geophys survey, we uncovered Roman graves. The diggers wore anti-contamination suits because there was a good chance of retrieving DNA samples from the Roman skeletons. Our first burial. I'll have to be careful getting in because we've got some pretty exciting archaeology here. This, this is incredible. And, and Margaret, well, I can't stop her eulogising <laughs> about the quality of the skull. Yeah, it's just <laughs> in wonderful condition. And we, we found evidence of a dozen burials all on live TV. Phil, what have you been doing? And then on day three came one of those moments that just pulls you up. The skeleton of a child. ..clearing out around the ribs, and they are just so, so delicate. I mean, this poor little infant, four years old, and what, who died in 250 AD or thereabouts. For the first time on a Time Team dig, we had the technology actually on site to run DNA tests on the human remains. Usually, DNA results come in long after a dig has been completed. But we managed to test material from one of the infant's tiny teeth and deliver the results back to the trenches while they were still being excavated. Your one is a little girl. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, here I am. I've done, oh, I don't know how many skeletons. It's the first time I've ever got the sex determined actually on site before the bones are taken out. It's incredible. Well done, everybody. 
a great three days. Cheers. Having marauded through somewhere as precious as York for a long weekend and got away with it, we were looking to push at the boundaries of archaeology itself. And on a wing and a prayer, we flew over to France to dig up the most evocative relic of World War II. The Air of Roy was the site of the wreck of one of the first combat Spitfires. Pilot Sergeant Paul Klipsch had come down in the first months of the war and was buried in a nearby churchyard. History that's still within living memory tends not to need the attentions of archaeologists. But we jumped at the chance of a World War II dig because our aim was to recover the Spitfire and piece together what happened on that fateful day. So we teamed up with air crash investigator Steve Moss. I think archaeological techniques are more appropriate to this because we're 59 years late on the accident site and <laughs> we need every bit of help we can get. Our approach would show how archaeology could answer questions the history books couldn't. Crikey, this has moved on a lot since I saw it last. Yeah, it's amazing. We've now got most of it exposed. This yeah. was all sitting in that tiny black hole. We've got... Uh, 30 feet of fuselage here, front to back, and it's compressed into what? Five feet. You've got the tail wheel there. You see that with the dunnel oh, yeah. on it there? This is quite amazing as well. Uh, the, the, the engine has just split open. Um, you can see Rolls-Royce. That's the top of uh, the engine. And we're getting the same sort of components from the other side of the engine split apart. There'd be no chance of lifting the Spitfire in one piece. Unusually for our team, we were trying to get to the bottom of the cause of a crash. But it felt as if the chances of finding any clues among this mangled wreckage were pretty low. A key moment came with the discovery of one of the Spitfire's machine guns. What's all this? It's a whole load of bullets together. Can you see there? There's no indentation. Yes. They've been fired the uh, mechanism would have indented the top. So what do you think the story might be? Well, it looks as if Klipsch didn't get much of a chance to have a crack at the enemy before he got shot himself, because he hasn't used so many of his bullets. As well as the bullets still in the machine guns that suggested pilot Paul Klipsch hadn't fired a shot, it was the enemy bullet holes in the cockpit that gave us the final piece of evidence we needed. It's almost certain that Paul Klipsch was killed instantly in mid-air. The state of the wreckage told us the Spitfire had hit the ground at around 400 miles per hour, meaning no attempt had been made to regain control of the aircraft. It was an emotional and memorable dig. You've got the plane itself, you've got the archaeology, you've got the human story, uh, and I suppose throw in a bit of the fact that it was Time Team International in a way, because we were actually digging a bit of Britain in France, you know. In eight years, we dug so many different sites that it felt like we could solve any archaeological mystery. But in 2001, a site came our way that was truly baffling. In a secluded valley in Mid Wales, we came face to face with an abundance of spectacular finds. Unravelling this site would test every skill at our disposal. Tlagadwy has gone down in history as the viewer's and our team's favourite episode. On this Powys farm, the owners had called us in to investigate what seemed to be an archaeological theme park. Standing stones, strange ancient carvings and the remains of a Norman castle. On day one, we realised that the archaeology wasn't quite right. We really had no idea what we were dealing with. But there's a few funny things about the whole building, really. It looks very odd, doesn't it? You see, Barney Sloan was one of my right-hand men then, and he said, what do you want me to do then, Mick? And I said, well, go and sort out this Norman castle. You see one of the corbels there? Oh, this, this thing here? Yeah. Yeah? That's one of the supporting stones that runs through the wall, but it's supposed to be the other way up. It's upside down, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that's one thing, and then there's the fireplace, yeah. but there's no sign of any reddening or fire damage or anything, so a fireplace that's never been used. 
And what he did was ferry it under the foundations of this big, great big wall. And these stones go right underneath the wall. You can see that, right yeah. underneath it. Yeah. Underneath those, there's oh. a piece of something like a Keeler marmalade jar or something. You don't get much better stratigraphy. Well, no, no, you <laughs> don't know. The timeline made no sense. An 800-year-old building on top of a century-old jar. And that wasn't all. We were excavating a supposed Iron Age well, ritual well, where religious offerings were made, and there was a sword of the right period. Um, you've got straight. It's a sword. No. It's a okay. no, look, look. <laughs> it's, look, it's coming straight back. That's, like that. that's, the, that's the handle of it. Well, I know, oh, might not. Wow. God, but I don't it's, Oh, wait a minute, what is it? Oh, I'm a bit worried about this barbed wire. It seems to be heading in the direction oh, no, of the sword. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh dear. Wait, go on. Go on. Look, it no. can't go over the top now. It's got no. it's gotta go it does. Oh, no. <laughs> this was a devastating discovery. How could an Iron Age sword have been resting on barbed wire? We work on the basic principle that the higher something is in the ground, the more modern. So when you get a, a, a an Iron Age or a Bronze Age sword above a piece of barbed wire, it's got to be phony. That is absolutely bloody criminal to put an item like that in the ground. That oh, is terrible. No. I don't think there was anything on that farm that wasn't fake. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit dodgy, isn't it? And basically, we just looked at each of these so-called monuments, tested them to destruction. No one has ever admitted responsibility for this elaborate hoax. But the fact we proved the site was fake was important. We demonstrated that at its best, archaeological method was a scientific process. We've stopped a load of rubbish getting into the record. You know, archaeology has actually worked out how old they yeah, are. Yeah, I mean, it is a total thought process. You know, we, we set ourselves goals, and each time we, we, we ticked them off. Fortunately, most of our sites yield genuine finds, objects that haven't been seen or touched for hundreds, even thousands of years. Come on, sweetheart. Much of what we've uncovered has given us new insights into aspects of our own history, but a few finds have been really jaw-dropping. Byzantine buckets unearthed at Bremer in Hampshire transformed our perceptions of the Dark Ages. Look at this, here. It's absolutely amazing, isn't it? You can see the copper alloy bands around it, decorative bands down four sides. Beautiful, beautiful object. At Codnock Castle in Derbyshire, we unearthed our first and only gold coin, which dated to Henry V. My hand's shaking. Oh, Come here, look at, look at that. <laughs> it, that is absolutely quite incredible. Have any of you ever found a large gold coin before as archaeologists? No! no. But while a Henry V gold coin felt pretty special, it wouldn't be long before that was eclipsed. Stay with us to find out what happened when we got the green light to dig the Queen's back garden. Right, put a trench in here. We're actually going to put a trench in here. After making well over 100 programmes, we knew that loads of our viewers were genuinely fascinated by archaeology. We'd shared the excitement of instant geophys results and the secrets of dating pottery with the world. But we wanted to take the next step and let as many keen amateurs as possible actually get their hands dirty on a dig. Mick proposed the idea of the big dig to get the public back into archaeology and um, it was a resounding success. The call went out and thousands of people all over the country signed up to dig one metre square test pits in their back gardens. It was a week-long event with live programmes every day. People had the chance to experience being part of a major archaeological project for themselves. You've done your first spit, you've yeah. got it recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Next 10 centimetre spit, keep the fine separate like you are, and carry on. Sorry for this hard work, all right? <laughs> By compiling information gleaned from the test pits across towns and villages, we were able to create a map of local histories. And it was a very, very obvious way that the, the general public could get involved. 
What it did do was, again, alert a lot of people to how interesting it all was and how much you could learn out of your garden. Are you lot happy to do a bit of digging? Yeah! Having helped all the volunteers by distributing a big dig info pack, our site visits probably confused them, but we enjoyed it. Carenza, what have you got there? <laughs> we've got bits of late Roman pottery dating to the very late 4th century, and then we've got bits of early Anglo-Saxon pottery here, probably dating to the 5th and early 6th century. So basically, from this pit, we have had more older Roman and Saxon pottery than anywhere else in the village. Although we thought that up here we were on the edge of the medieval village, and it looks like we were, because there's not much med stuff, it's the core of activity in the Roman and Saxon period. Building on the success of the Big Dig, we again asked local volunteers and archaeologists across Britain to help us on an even more ambitious collective project to uncover Roman Britain. Already on the big Roman dig, we've opened a lead mine in Somerset and seen how the Romans exported huge quantities of lead. We've tested whether volunteers could survive the life of a Roman squaddy. We've seen the real layout of our grand villa here at Dinnington with amazing ground penetrating radar. And we're uncovering what promises to be one of Britain's finest mosaics. Francis hovering away in the background. Let's try him again. Francis! From the hub of our operation at Dinnington, I could talk to our people all over the country. We dug the place two years earlier and uncovered one of the biggest Roman villas to be found for decades. Now, with a much bigger team, we'd reveal pretty much the whole structure. I would say, without any hesitation, that if this had survived, it would have been one of the finest mosaics in Britain. Right. And with the success of these two huge events as our credentials, in 2006, we got a rather special invitation. In the big royal dig, we were given unprecedented access to invade the gardens, attics and cellars of Britain's three occupied royal palaces simultaneously. Oh, yes, this is just like the Prosnier March in front of a theatre stage, isn't it? It is. Our army of experts was deployed to Windsor Castle in Berkshire, Holyrood House in Scotland, and Buckingham Palace in the heart of London. Mr Tony Robinson, ma'am, and Mr Philip Harding. Hello, ma'am. In Windsor, we may have the very, very first palace that's been just under the but ground that's, there. That's near the, the uh, chapel. Oh, after, yeah. Are they going to dig up everything? <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe you're, you're likely to be in Scotland, are you? Well, we're... we're, 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 we're <laughs> well, that was a nice old chat, wasn't it? That was indeed. As if digging royal gardens wasn't enough, we were again doing it live. The team were joined by an array of experts and well-known faces to dig the three sites. It was Windsor Castle that would give us the big payoff, but first we had to unravel a thousand years of royal redevelopment. Experts had long been puzzled as to the whereabouts of two really important royal buildings that disappeared hundreds of years ago, if they ever existed. Now we had the chance to mount a full-scale hunt for them. Yes, I mean, how on earth... Guest archaeologist you... Julian Mumby had been fascinated for years by one of those lost buildings. It was the stuff legends were made of. So, Julian, what are you hoping to find underneath this lawn? Well, it's an amazing opportunity to discover a really extraordinary building, King Edward III's Round Table. It's very big, royal building for the King and his knights, and we don't actually know what it was used for. So it's a bit of a mystery. It's a complete mystery. The building had been mentioned in the records, but not its precise location. So finding it was all down to Geophys. Using the latest underground radar, they came up trumps and revealed something that would enter the history books. A clear, curved wall emerged, measuring 200 feet in diameter. Dimensions that matched historical accounts of the lost round table building that was thought to be constructed from wood. Edward III and his guests used it to play out a kind of royal fantasy with feasting and rowdy entertainment based on the Arthurian legends of the Knights of the Round Table. But could we discover more about this lost arena? 
it seems we could. The evidence more and more is looking like a big masonry building with columns of stone and not timber, but still open in the middle. Our trenches were uncovering one of the most important unknown medieval structures. Now here, right down the left-hand side of this trench, yeah. we've got compacted chalk, and this, we actually believe, is the floor of the round table building. So, 700 years ago, people would have been walking at that level across the Not actually floor. on there, on a floor laid on top of it. Come and look at this. We have uncovered this tile. Emily, show us what you've got. Well, we've got this floor tile here, and um, we're thinking it probably is actually in situ. That is, is that, I mean, can I lift that up and touch no, it? No, no, it's actually embedded into the, uh, into the mortar, the hard mortar around it. And here you, you can see. But, but real, that is really Edward III's proper yes. fancy tiled floor. And it's even got a round design on it. You two must be royally chuffed. You've uncovered your round table building live on telly. It's unimaginable. It's absolutely fantastic. It's not quite the forest of timber, we thought, but there's a great array of stone columns and arches looking seriously large and very royal. We know it's there, we know what sort of condition it is, we know what its extent is, uh, we know what date it is, we know what its function is, and therefore, even that with that one trench, you've ticked all the boxes that you really need to tick. You don't need to dig the whole bally thing. You've done it. And you know, and it is part of our national history. But while Time Team was still riding high, out there in the real world, life had got tougher for everyone. The financial crash had almost killed off property development. So with a slowdown in the building industry, there was little demand for the archaeological surveys that had to be done before sites can be built on. At this time, developers ceased to be the largest funders of archaeology in Britain. And... I was astonished to read that Time Team should eventually be one of the biggest funders of archaeology in Britain. And the big state institutions, people like English Heritage and the National Trust, called on us, because we were one of the few people who could have done it, to investigate their main sites. So now we even had public organisations knocking on Time Team's door offering us a crack at some great sites that needed a proper once-over. Dartmoor National Park and South West Water invited us down to check out the intriguing idea that there might be a whole Stone Age complex on the bed of a reservoir. The water had been drained away, but this was no walk in the park. It was unbelievably muddy, and the poor geophysics people, I can remember seeing them drag the, 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 the heavy old radar across this mud, sort of, going, sort of glooping across the landscape. Um, but I couldn't believe what we found. Oh, dream time. As well as Stone Age tools, we located a mysterious 8,000-year-old mound and then two parallel lines of stones that turned out to be an early Bronze Age ceremonial walkway. But when we discovered some much bigger stones in the mud, we knew we were onto something very rare, a previously unknown stone circle. This really is exciting. We've got the hole that the stone was placed in. Right, but more than that, we've got the stones that were put in there deliberately to wedge it to get it at precisely the right angle. So you wouldn't do that if you were just making a field boundary wall or something. It, it was an extraordinary site, an intact Bronze Age, Neolithic and Bronze Age stone circle. I couldn't believe it, you know, stone still that high. Matt, what have you got coming out of this little trench? Well, we've been clearing up this stone here and it's much bigger than we expected. It looks like it's a good five foot long standing stone that's just fallen over. So you think that it's prehistoric? Oh yeah, without question. Phil, is that something there? That is another stone hole, Tony. Another prehistoric stone? Another part of the stone circle, absolutely equidistant between that stone there and where Matt is. The stone circle was the first to be discovered in Britain for 150 years and we pieced together how this unique valley was used by Stone Age people, hunter-gatherers and farmers, 
as a ceremonial site. I mean, this is a very special place. We're in a sort of natural amphitheatre, and all their religious monuments, their constructions, are all intimately related to a very small-scale landscape. And the ceremonies that were going on here happened over an incredibly long time, three, four thousand years. So it's all about people's religion developing out of the landscape. It also happened to be our 200th dig, which we duly celebrated. Since then, we've marched on through another two series to reach our astounding tally of 224 excavations. It's been quite an experience, which has helped to change the image of archaeology in Britain. Action. This 70-foot Norman tower is all... For two decades, we've investigated the origins of towns, villages and cities across Britain. It's the biggest glass bead I've ever seen, and it's beautiful. Oh, look at that. Every dig adds something to our knowledge of the past, and the archaeology we've uncovered has been recorded in published reports, which are a lasting legacy available for anyone to study when they're old enough. So we're the first people to see this since the Romans 1,700 years ago. Time teams not only become something of a national institution, but it's transformed the way that millions of us understand Britain's history and its heritage. Even if we are still a bit of a motley crew. <laughs> And you can explore Time Team's 20-year archive on 4OD at channel4.com slash timeteam. Up next tonight, Sunday's Channel 4 News.